Well, today's uh, question is, can we develop a theory of the biosphere? And what actually is known about that? And that seems like a very obvious question, but as soon as you start looking for it, you will find that there is no such thing as a theory of the biosphere. And that is very surprising. And if you take even more distance, then you will find that if you look at the whole trajectory of big history, then you find that there are certain areas that have very clearly established theories, like the theory of plate tectonics or Big Bang cosmology, but there are other areas that actually don't have them. And this is one of them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's take a look at uh, our uh, Earth. Here you see the Earth uh, photographed from a spacecraft that was actually on its way to visit some asteroids. Asteroids are life uh, less objects and now it's hanging out there and it's taking all kind of uh, making all kind of very interesting observations. And in the distance you see the moon and the moon is obviously lifeless. There's no life at all on the moon and on the surface of the Earth there is. So what you're looking at is two globes, one with life, one without. And if you look at the solar system, then you'll find the same pattern. You find a very big globe, that's the sun, no life there. You find some other big globes like Jupiter and Saturn, no life there as far as we know. And then some tiny globes, one of them is Earth, and that's, there is life. And perhaps there is life on some of the moons of, of Jupiter and perhaps Saturn. We don't really know, there might be life. And here you see Jupiter and some of its satellites. You see can see four little dots, if you look carefully, uh, circling around uh, Jupiter. This photo was actually taken by my son Louis, who used a basic uh, Canon camera, and, and it works. So actually this is what you can observe. This is what Galileo observed, and this is what made him think that if Jupiter can carry its satellites along, why would the Sun not be able to do the same? So why would the Earth not revolve around the Sun? Now, if we zoom out again and we look at our galaxy, of course, we cannot do that uh, in reality. But So this is another galaxy that we think looks like ours. Then we see, in fact, a, a huge collection of globes of all kinds of sizes. And we don't really know whether there's life in there or not. We're trying to find out more about it, but we haven't found any single globe with life other than the Earth. So what you're looking at, if you look at the universe, is a whole collection of globes, one with life, perhaps more with life, most without life. Now what is it that distinguishes globes with life from globes without life? And actually, could you come up with a whole systematic approach to that? And if you start uh, looking around, then you find that actually it doesn't exist. Because people have been focusing so much on the Earth that, to my knowledge, no scholar has yet zoomed out to think about the problem more in general. So I am now proposing, very preliminarily, to call all these surfaces of globes uh, globospheres. And if it contains life and it has special interactions as a result, you look at it and you call it a biosphere. So what we have is globe with globospheres and globes, at least one, with a biosphere. And then you can go and think about the systematics of it. What would, let's say, globospheres look like without an atmosphere, like Mercury, or the Moon? Or one with a tiny little atmosphere, like Mars? Or one with a pretty thick atmosphere, like Venus? Or one that is basically almost one big atmosphere, like Jupiter or Saturn? So you could actually start classifying them in different types of, of, of globospheres and looking at the systematics of the process, and that hasn't been done yet. Uh, but I want to focus now on what distinguishes globospheres from biospheres, and let's look at the work done by a Russian scientist, Vladimir Vernadsky, who is in Russia considered the Darwin of, of their science. And the reason for that is that he elaborated as was the first, in fact, to elaborate the term uh, biosphere. He didn't coin it, he picked it up from another scientist, I think from Switzerland, 
um, but he did elaborate it. And here you see a university where he is yeah, almost venerated. This is the university in Dubna. Uh, that is the only university in the world that actually requires students to always ask the question, what is the relevance of your project for the natural environment? And here you see Vanitsch, uh, Vernatsky displayed in a, in a little corner at the entrance, uh, almost like in a church-like uh, setting, one would say. And uh, also perhaps nice to know that, that Dubna is the place where the Russians pursued and still pursued a nuclear technology. So in Soviet times, it, it was super secret. And they have a, a particle accelerator there that actually did fundamental research and actually one of the chemical elements is named after Dubna, Dubnium. So it's quite a place there and, and a lot of, lot of intelligent people there. Now what did uh, Vernatsky propose? He said there are two characteristics at least that characterize a biosphere. And one is the accumulation of free energy, he says. And that means that there is stuff that can actually do things, that contains energy so it can do things like coal that we can burn. Now, without life, there would have been no coal and there would have been no oxygen in the atmosphere. So nothing could burn because there would be nothing to burn and there would be no oxygen with aid of which it can be burned. And that's all the result of the actions of life. So the accumulation of free energy is a sure sign, he says, that yes, there is, there, there is life. That is what differentiates a biosphere from a globosphere. And the second point is that you get an unusual distribution of atoms and molecules. It means you find them in places where they would otherwise not be. So you get sedimentary layers filled up with molecules created by life. So all these things, that is, for instance, what uh, Mars exploration is currently about. These Mars rovers that are looking for signs of life, not life itself, but Let's say the changes in the globosphere or biosphere of Mars, we don't know yet, uh, that would indicate that actually once was a biosphere, perhaps there is still a biosphere and that there is perhaps life to be found on Mars. But there's more to it. And that is what uh, the British scientist James Lovelock pointed out. He uh, tried to answer the question of why is it that the Earth has remained livable, that there is still liquid water on the Earth after billions of years of development while the Sun has heated up at least 25%. So why didn't the Earth boil dry? What happened? And his answer is that uh, living organisms actually uh, sucked out a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and converted it into rocks and other sedimentary metals, uh, uh, materials um, and as a result, lowered the greenhouse effect of uh, the atmosphere. And as a result, more radiation could be radiated out into the universe and the Earth stayed cool. So there is a feedback process caused by life that creates the circumstances for its continued survival. That is his argument. And that's what he called the Gaia hypothesis. And there may be a lot more to that than that. And that is all being researched right now. So what we are seeing currently is several components, important components that could form a theory of the biosphere, but that we don't have a comprehensive theory yet. So how can we do that? How can we combine all of that into one single coherent theory of the biosphere? We need your help.